those of you who are here now, uh, uh, most of you, for most of you, she needs no introduction. So I think I'll just kind of go with the fact that she now runs a YouTube show that's called Absolute Outlaws um, <laughs> with over 100,000 subscribers. But Jenny uh, uh, has taught at Harvard, she's taught at Michigan. We're super lucky to have her here teaching at NYU today. And she has really, for many of us, defined what it meant to be an independent journalist in Putin's Russia. The really the epitome, the epitome of what that has done. She has been at Echo Must Be. She has been at her own, as she has been the editor of the New Times for forever, uh, I guess since 2007 now. Um, and she has been a professor at the, at the Higher School of Economics. As I said, she's been at, at Michigan at Harvard. She is, was an inaugural fellow at the Cali Writers House, the University of Pennsylvania. It goes on and on, the list goes on and on. But of course, her life, like many people's lives, was completely upended by the events of the past seven months. We are absolutely thrilled to be able to have her here at the Jordan Center to support the cause of independent journalism on Russia uh, as it goes forward in whatever form it can possibly take. This is obviously not the ideal form, uh, but it is what we are making do with at the moment. And we are incredibly fortunate to have her here today to be able to share with her, with us, her observations. I think in many ways, this grew out of the fact that I was having lunch with Jenya when she finally made it to the US, when we finally knew she was going to get here. And I thought, I'm not the only one who wants to be sitting here asking her these questions. And so we wanted to share this opportunity. The, the theme of this talk is essentially there is no, you know, there, the, the theme of this talk is like, She's here. She has a lot to say. Those of you who know Jenny, I know that's nothing new. Um, and that we want to give an opportunity for her to speak to those who are interested about the current situation in Russia while she's still very freshly removed from Russia. So the format here today, I'm going to give Jenny an introductory statement. I will say ahead of time, I said, oh, do you have a prepared talk, you know, for like a half an hour or so? And she said, no, 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 not at all. Let's just do question and answer. We'll do this conversation. And I said, great. We'll have you start with an introductory statement. You can be the judge after the introductory statement, whether she had a prepared talk for 30 minutes or not. Before <laughs> the introductory statement. Um, but provided it doesn't go on too long, I'll do some questions. We'll have a little conversation, the two of us here, um, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience and we can go as late as, uh, as 5.30. For those of you who are on Zoom, we're using the webinar format. You should all know the drill on that by now, but you can put uh, questions in the Q&A and we will be monitoring those questions. Um, and we'll try to grab some of the questions from those of you who are on Zoom as well. But we have so many people as, uh, as you will be able to see when we have the camera hooked. So the audience, we have a lot of people here. So we're gonna try and take questions from people in the audience too. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over. Oh, and I haven't said the most important uh, part of Jenny's biography which is that she was a classmate of mine when I started my PhD in the fall of 1994. Um, and our upper class, one of our upperclassmen who was here from the year ahead of us, Roy McFarquhar, is now here as well. So it's a little bit of reunion from the early 1990s from graduate school and mid 1990s going on as well. So I've had the great opportunity, the great pleasure of knowing Jenya now for almost three decades. And uh, yeah, almost three decades. Um, <laughs> almost three decades, um, and uh, it's, I, I'm thrilled to have her here at NYU. It's going to be incredibly valuable to have her here all year for the teaching, for the programming she's going to run here for the Jordan Center. Um, we'll have information about it, but for now, I want to just turn it over here, turn it over to her so we can hear from her. So, Jenya, what do we need to know about what's going on in Russia? Josh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming. First of all, I would like to express my Sincere gratitude to Josh, to you personally, because he did the anonymous thing. You know, I, I'm not going to go into details unless Josh decides to do this. It was a real difficult thing to do. Uh, you know, through, uh, you know, of course, you know, when the war started on February 24th, our life went upside down. Uh, I think, you know, basically all of us will understand that, you know, the life that we knew before. February 24th is not going to come back. Uh, and I'm afraid not just for us in Russia and Ukraine, not just for us in Eastern Europe, not just for us in Europe, but here in the United States as well. It's a profound, profound change of the world politics. And it will have, this war will have consequence all across the world, I'm afraid. Uh, however, you know, some would argue that basically we see the continuation of the end of the Cold War and disintegration of the Soviet Union, which just took 
that long for the empire to dissolve finally and it's in, in the process of disintegration further down. And unfortunately, as it happened with many empires, uh, it, it, it's not going to be very peaceful and it's going to be bloody and messy and God knows what's going to be left with, uh, from my country that I love and I admire, and I would prefer definitely to be there and to uh, write for my fellow citizens. I also, uh, I would like to, uh, to uh, I'm very grateful to the, uh, to the uh, NYU, and you know, to the general community, the political science department and Russian Slavic department of this university, I should tell you that I had, you know, uh, through all the six months, I had, you know, numerous um, approaches from different uh, universities and institutions in different countries and uh, quite a few from the United States. I'm very grateful to all these people who cared about, uh, uh, me basically on a daily basis i was getting uh, uh letters from uh, my friends from my colleagues uh, both you know in my head as a journalist and my head as an academic and uh, uh as saying something like jenny don't you think it's time for you to go i have a friend of mine you know who used to call me every 10 days and uh, she would say i booked you a ticket I said, no, 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 <laughs> you're not going to do that. No, no, I already booked you a very nice apartment in downtown Riga. Riga, it's, a, uh, it's a, uh, you, the, across two borders from Russia. You can do it by land. So, uh, and, it's, and it was like every 10 days. Jane, you have to understand, if New York Times left and CNN left and Sky News and all of them left, you know, right after the war started because, you know, be, you know all these the new... Uh, laws of war were introduced, or uh, uh, wartime censorship laws were introduced that basically made it impossible, illegal to use the word war, invasion, all that was totally forbidden. So, and she was say, telling me, you know, listen, this New York Times left, you have to understand that they know something. I said, of course they know not something, <laughs> and I know something. Listen, don't tell me, you know, they, they don't know anything that I don't know, but, you know, it's becoming a little bit dangerous to work in Russia, but, you know, what can we do? You know, I cannot move, you know, Russia is a big country, 144 million people. You know, I cannot just take them all and move somewhere to the moon, unfortunately, yet, not yet. And so, and you know, but I have, of course, you know, my responsibility to these people. I have my obligations to these people. I'm a citizen of the Russian Federation, and trust me, it's a lovely country. It's just a tragic country of tragic history, tragic reality, tragic contemporary situation, which decided, you know, which has an awful regime that decided to destroy Ukrainian. Ukraine. And before I will proceed any further, whether there are Ukrainians here in the audience, whether the Ukrainians uh, on the Zoom, I should say that I feel deeply ashamed for what my country, Russian Federation, uh, Putin's regime did to Ukraine. I feel, you know, for the first two months of the war, I was just crying on a daily basis. And those who know me know that it's not that easy for me to get to tears. That, you know, and I constantly feel that I am responsible for what my government is doing uh, with Ukraine, with its cities, with children that got killed, with civilians, you know, that are, according to United Nations, just recorded amount of uh, deaths among civilians is almost 15,000. There was a recorded uh, uh, data for children, kids, for 500. And each time when we see all these uh, pictures uh, uh, from the Ukrainian cities and villages and towns, and, you know, and we see that Putin is turning this country into pieces, is, is, is destroying this country into pieces. He's trying to put it into dust. It is both rational and irrational on this part of, or on, 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 you know, on the part of this dictator, what he's doing uh, with Ukraine. And unfortunately, you know, what makes me totally sick is to think that the entire world, all of us, were watching 
how Putin is destroying Ukrainian cities. You know, Mariupol, Mariupol no longer exists. 89% of those who lived in Mariupol, they considered Russian, Russian as their native language. Kharkiv, the center of Kharkiv, uh, the first capital of Ukraine, of independent Ukraine, uh, you know, back uh, after the revolution, 95% of the citizens of Kharkiv considered Russian as their native language. Totally destroyed the downtown Kharkiv. Uh, Nikolaev, Nikolaev, uh, according to the latest census, um, uh, more than 50% of Nikolaev, of citizens of Nikolaev, Nikolaev as we used to say, uh, they consider Russia as their own city. My father, Mark Alberts, was parachuted over the German occupied territory of Ukraine on September the 5th, 1941. That's what we call the Great Patriotic War, the war with, you know, uh, with Germany. He was parachuted there. His, he was a student and, you know, his job was uh, to spy on the German troops. Of course, you know, he was a Jew of course, and, you know, by legend, he was a, a Georgian, you know, Grigory Basile. Now, my, it is the same Nikolaev when my dad fought against Germans. Now, Germany submit uh, tanks and anti-tanks weapons to Ukrainians to fight Russians. You just think about this. You are getting totally crazy when you think, you know, I walked streets of Mykolaiv. I went there, I, you know, I, I know, you know, I walked Ukrainian basically by foot, you know, the uh, southern part of Ukraine and, you know, certainly in yeah, the western part of Ukraine. I know there each and every battle, you know, I walked the city of Nikolaev, and I was talking, I was interviewing, uh, you know, a colleague of mine, Lena Kostichenko, who was reporting from Nikolaev, and he, he was saying, Jenny, you know, it's going to be very dark because, you know, uh, we have, a, you know, there are no lights in the evening, and uh, Russians, they shoot apartments. And once again, I mean, it's, it's happening, it was happening in the city where my father fought Germans, and now German submit anti-tank weapons to Ukrainians to fight my fellow citizens, Russians. So it is just to say that this war, what is happening there, it's not just, uh, you know, just about politics, not just about, you know, comparative politics, not just about comparative study of Eastern Europe. It is something very, very personal to me. And, uh, you know, because, and, you know, it's, 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 that's part of the reason why it was so difficult for me to move out of Russia. Because you have, you know, at least, you know, that's, you know, it's, it's lovely and very comfortable here. And I'm, once again, I'm very grateful to everyone who helped me uh, to get a shelter here. However, you know, when, at least, when I'm in Moscow, I feel like at least I fight this awful regime. At least I do something to open eyes of my fellow citizens, because, you know, after the uh, war started, uh, five days into the war, my own New Times was blocked. We, since then, were working using virtual private network. Uh, each, uh, and uh, Moscow, where I had my uh, show, Al Absolute Alberts, for, uh, in fact, you know, it's not, in Russian, it's a little bit different, but anyway, Paul Nelbert. But anyway, so for those who know Russian, uh, you know, you understand what it's all about. But you know, anyway, so uh, uh, it was closed uh, the second week into the war. Uh, the only independent uh, channel existed, the cable channel Dost, TV Rain, closed. Each and every outlet closed. Our licenses were withdrawn. Nova Gazeta lost its licenses two weeks ago. So everything, you know, uh, uh, as of now, according to the monitoring organization uh, called Roscom Svoboda, Roscom Svoboda, Ross Freedom, right? Ross from for Russia. Uh, six, uh, six, 7,000 websites are closed because of uh, any kind of opposition uh, narrative. Each and every independent outlet either banned or totally closed or forced to get closed and etc. 
So, uh, so that's why, you know, when I was in, in Russia, the only way to get to know what was happening inside the country, I knew much more about what was happening in Ukraine. Basically, we, it's the first time in our life or uh, when we have, you know, uh, a war, uh, just live, we are watching this war and probably it will be the best documented war ever. However, you know, there is nothing, no information, was no information about Russia. So the only way for me to get to know and to report this was to get into my car and drive to different cities of the Russian Federation and ask people on the streets and ask people on the markets and ask you, and you know, it was, it, you know, I love doing this. This is, you know, it's a great reporting job. However, that was, you know, at one city in the city of Tver, it is 300 kilometers west of Moscow, uh, a rabbi kicked me out of the shoe. Why? I introduced myself and he called me Ukrainian slut, you know? So, because, well, of course, you know, I'm pretty well known in, uh, in my country. However, you know, because I was reporting about Ukraine. And, you know, people are getting that crazy, you know, about this. So that's my short introduction. Okay. I tried it. All right. So let me, the first question that I want to ask you about is just to go straight to contemporary events, because I think a lot of people here are following this. And we, we'll, we'll delve back a little bit more to the experience of the last seven months. But maybe linking those two things, based on what you saw traveling around Russia, how do you feel Russia is going to react to this announcement of partial mobilization? Based on A, what you saw over the past seven months, did you think it would come to this? Did you think that was actually an option that it would come to this? And now based on what you've seen from your own networks in the last 24 to 36 hours, um, how do you think this is going to impact, before we get into the war, how do you think this is going to impact what is happening in Russia Russian, the way that Russians feel about the war, the way that Russians feel about the Putin regime. This feels like a kind of Rubicon moment. Um, and I would be incredibly interested in your insights because as you said, it's become harder and harder for those of us on the outside to know what's going on inside Russia. There's a lot of speculation. We've, there's lots and lots of analysis we can read about the extent to which this is going to bolster the military effort. And we have, you know, and, and all sorts of problems and concerns that there will be in terms of like integrating new troops into the into the forces and, and these sorts of things. But from the Russian side of support for this war, is this a, going to be a major game changer? Is this going to engender um, a different reaction on the part of the Russian population? And maybe I would also just preface with, if from the outside it looks like the generic reaction of the Russian population, besides the people we see on the streets protesting, besides the people we see getting arrested. But the, the sort of generic reaction so far has been, and the story has been, how much can people in Russia pretend that things are sort of life is normal, that the sanctions aren't as bad as they were? Yes, there's some money. We can't travel to Europe. We can still travel to Dubai, right? Does this now change the veneer of normalcy significantly? Or was there never a veneer of normalcy at all? And from and that's just a, a mistaken impression from the outside. Or does this not change it that much? And it's not as much of a, a Rubicon moment as we, as we might think it is. Thank you. Uh, of course, it is a $1 billion question. Uh, and in fact, you know, there are several questions that you ask. For one, I think that uh, it's a manifestation of the fact that Vladimir Putin is fighting uh, for his life both uh, life as a president and as a person. Secondary, I think that, uh, first of all, you know, it's very, you know, what, just to give you an example, you know, I have to call my friends over there who are still there, and there are very few, there are no journals uh, almost left, you know, but I have to call somehow my sources to find out what's really going on. We do know, that Putin didn't want uh, to announce any mobilization. In fact, you know, he was supposed to announce uh, these uh, 12 hours before he did that. And if you were to ask me a week ago whether Putin was going to go for this mobilization, I would say no way. Because the whole idea of this special military operation and the reason why they didn't allow uh, to ask journalists to use the war 
to, to use the word, the word war, invasion, etc., because the idea was Russian army is fighting, uh, you know, the special military operation against this Nazi in Ukraine. However, everything, you know, life is going on, it's normal. And even though the life well, is not exactly normal as it was, it's, it's not normal for the middle class. It's not normal for, the, for uh, people of Moscow because, you know, it's the richest uh, city in the country. However, you know, more or less, yes, prices went up significantly. You know, food prices went up uh, about 20%, you know, for some stuff, uh, you know, for some, you know, domestic stuff, uh, or prices went 43%, 45%, you know. So, yes, you cannot find certain things in, in, the, in, in terms of groceries, commodities, etc. but that's okay, you know, there is nothing, you know, special. Uh, yes, you cannot no longer can buy a car. Yes, you no longer a phone made car. Yes, you no longer can. Uh, if you did something wrong to your car, then you cannot repair it. It's true. But once again, that was that became a problem uh, for this uh, wealthy Moscovites. For the rest of the country, it's not a problem. However, the problem is now because now it's they call it partial mobilization. But you know, if you read the documents. There is nothing partial. In fact, they raise the age. They raise your know, before is before uh, those who had three kids in the family were uh, couldn't be drafted. Now they they change it to four kids in the family. So they raise you know the age uh, for different categories. And in fact, you know, anyone can be drafted. And we already know that Putin said in his speech that only people with the military experience were going to be drafted. But we already know that people with no military experience, with no, who never were conscripts, were drafted and settled. So that's for one. So it, it is to say that uh, Putin is doing extremely dangerous, he did an extremely dangerous step. Because um, as we were well aware, you know, there was a recent book written by Guri and Trisman, very good, Spin Dictators. Uh, and basically the hypothesis is that this is this new type, 21st century type of dictators whose uh, uh, power and strength based on popularity rating. And so that's why they fight for the control over the information field. And so Putin's popularity ratings, you know, even though we don't know what, uh, and we can talk about this separately, and I would rather, I want to talk about this separately about the Russian attitudes, the attitudes of the rank and file towards the war, but uh, Putin's ratings are pretty high in uh, the country. They're below 50%, but still they're uh, big enough. And that was very important. Obviously, now when the war became uh, a problem, First and foremost, for those most poor, because obviously people with money and connections are going to buy their uh, sons and husbands and brothers out of this. It's obvious. So it's going to be a huge corruption market as it used to be uh, in the 80s during the war in Afghanistan when you know people were making people in the military were making millions out of. Uh, uh, or out of um, deciding who is going to go, uh, die in Afghanistan and who, uh, who didn't. So, uh, but the question is, you know, you have to give him a credit. He has political instincts, I mean, Putin. Why did he go for that? And my hypothesis is that after the, this quite unexpected counteroffense of the Ukrainian forces in Kharkov region, when basically Ukrainian forces all of a sudden kicked out uh, Russians all the way to the Russian border in the Lugansk district. In this whole idea that, you know, that the uh, Russians were going to conduct referendum and incorporate the occupied territories of Ukraine into its body, they, all these, you know, I, I did totally, at least as of now, failed. Because uh, Russians uh, used to control 59% of uh, Donetsk oblast and almost 100% of Lugansk oblast, no longer. 
If there will be the next step, the counteroffensive of the Ukrainian forces in, uh, in Kherson, that's the south of, uh, uh, of Ukraine, which basically connects through Mariupol, um, connects uh, to Crimea, then uh, Putin's basically dead, right? It's, and it's clear, it became pretty much clear with this counteroffensive that he was losing the war. Of course, the absolute majority of Russians didn't know about that. The absolute majority of Russians, those who don't use VPN, even though 25 million of them downloaded VPN in July alone. However, the majority, especially those who live in the Russian provinces and uh, they in, in the towns and villages, uh, they were told that Russian forces were just regrouping uh, their forces. Uh, Minister of Defense Shoigu said that uh, just some 5,800 uh, uh, Russians died during the war. We know that the figure is at least, you know, so-called, you know, uh, the, the total losses are 80,000 people. So, uh, and so, uh, so why did Putin go for that? And my hypothesis is the following, after these uh, or, uh, after this counteroffensive, after the success of uh, Ukrainian troops in, uh, in the East, he realized that he needs to set up a framework for negotiations. We call it Sazdat Perigavorna Pajitsu. How would you translate this, Rory? Okay. It's a stronger bargain. But yes, he's trying to create this bargain framework. You know, because basically he has nothing to put on the table. And, you know, that's what he said just recently in Samarkand. He said that, uh, you know, he said this to the president of uh, Turkey, Erdogan, that he would like to, uh, to finish this war as quickly as possible, but he has nothing to negotiate about. Because Zelensky is going to tell him, you know, sorry, guy, well, too late. We want you to get back to the pre-war borders. And on top of that, we want Donbass back and we want Crimea back. So, so, uh, so my suspicion that what, is, what he's, he, he's doing now, he's trying to tell Zelensky, uh, uh, look, Vladimir, I can throw 300,000 uh, human bodies. Um, and, uh, you, all of us were facing cold and dark winter. Right now, Putin, as we speak, he's destroying the civilian infrastructure. He is doing his best in order to, uh, to uh, uh, so that Ukrainians, Ukrainian cities wouldn't have heat, water, canalization, and et cetera in their cities. It's, it's a, especially in Kharkov, in Krivoy Ruk, in Sum, in Chernigov, you know, the, the infrastructure totally destroyed, just totally destroyed. Chernigov is, is you know, is, a, you know, ancient Ukrainian city. So, uh, so, and, uh, and so that's what Putin is trying to tell Zelensky, that, you know, basically, Vladimir, you have two options. Face this imminent, imminent, imminent reality, you know, with no heat and no water and very cold winter. And of course, you know, it's also a message to Europeans who are going to face problems with gas. Or negotiate with me. That's what I think he, uh, he's trying to do. He's trying to set up this bargain. Because if you talk to people to, if you talk like me to some sources, they will tell you that Russian generals don't believe that this is going to save a situation uh, on the front. Because it's not just about, yes, Russia is in dead need, Russian army is in dead need of the, uh, of, of, uh, the conscripts of soldiers and, you know, and uh, officers, etc. But it's not just that. Russia no longer have weapons. 
they turned out that despite of these, you know, all this blah, blah, blah about the, the second biggest and best army in the world, as it was, kept, everybody kept saying Russian Federation, uh, Putin, you know, Putin, you know, let's give him a credit. You know, he's a great guy, you know, he created, you know, at least, you know, he conducted this military reform. He created this great, you know, army, you know, most profound, you know, most contemporary weapons. Fuck no. <laughs> no. And then they stole. You know, it's amazing. It's amazing fact. All of us, we were reporting about, you know, these new Russian tanks, Armata, you know, uh, you know, that were presented at the parade at the, or, you know, at the Red Square. Where Armata? Uh -uh. No Armata. Nowhere. They just don't exist. So, you know, there's, uh, there's high precision weapons. Russians have high precision missiles. Yes, they did. They used to. No longer. Because they don't have semiconductors and they don't have chips. Because apparently in the most advanced Russian weapons, there are parts that were made either in the West or in Taiwan. What are you going to do with this? You cannot do nothing. Oh yes, of course, you know, you know, but Russians have probably military plans, military industrial complex. You know, Putin invested that much in Rostech, you know, his Paul Chenasov, you know, his former KGB guy, Paul, you know, he's running this huge state-owned corporation, uh, which had, you know, 500, uh, uh, 500 military plants which produce everything. No, apparently they cannot produce uh, machinery. They cannot. They don't have need, they don't have the equipment that needed to produce uh, missiles, because this equipment, apparently Russia was buying from Germany. Germany is no longer going to provide Russia with all this, and so it goes. And so what happens now is that, you know, there are a few calibre, you know, you know, more or less precision, well, you know, more or less, you know, last generation of missiles left. And everything else is just, you know, yes, there are hell of uh, Soviet main weapons. And that's part, by the way, of the problem that they're using grad, the grad uh, rocket system because, you know, uh, you cannot, you know, it's just, you know, you send this uh, missile and God knows where it's going to land. And who, God knows who, uh, 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 who it's going to kill. So basically, it's not just about, uh, and finally, Putin realizes that he no longer can trust any of his military. Because his military were telling him that, you know, they have, you know, this, the best, uh, the second best army in the world. His KGB guys were telling him, listen, you know, what's going to happen? Volodya, you understand, who are those Ukra Ukrainians? Oh, Ukrainians, they're hachli, hachli. Who cares about this hachli? You know, this snobby, upside down approach. Who are they? You know, when we enter, you know, when we approach Kiev, you know, this, you know, Zelensky, you know, clown. Who's Zelensky? Clown. Of course, you know, he was an actor. You know, and of course, you know, he performed on, in Moscow, you know, and never, you know, he was a popular comedian, you know, you would call him comedian probably, right? So, and you know, you know, he will run away right away. Listen, remember 2014, you know, Kovic, you know, the, the then uh, president of Russia who was backed up by Putin and, you know, he, the guy who spent certain years in jail, you know, in Russian psyche, it's important. That's what makes you much a man if you spend certain years in jail, right? Sorry, sorry. So, <laughs> so and apparently, you know, yes, he was, he, he, he was in jail for rape or something else. So, and when, you know, when there was Maidan, uh, you know, Yanukovych ran away from Ukraine. So, of course, you know, Putin's people believed that, you know, why Zelensky was going to be any better. All of them the same. All of them are going to run the minute they uh, uh, got to know that, they get to know that, you know, Russian special forces landed in Gomel. That's the military uh, airfield uh, in the outskirts of Kiev the capital of Ukraine. So, and he didn't. Listen, you know, Biden suggested him to, the, you know, the safe heaven. And Zelensky had no, said, no. If you don't, you know, all of us, I remember we were watching this, uh, this uh, video made on, uh, on, on the cell when Zelensky was saying, look, and 
it's recognizable, Bankovskaya, the Ulitsa way, you know, all the governmental buildings in Kiev. And he was saying, I'm here, President is here, speak of the Poland, here, Prime Minister is here. Da, da. It was amazing. It was amazing. They were under barbarism. But the problem is, and that's time and again what we see with Kremlin, that, you know, they believe that the world is run the way it is run in Russia. The people everywhere are that corrupted, that, you know, patriotism is something that doesn't exist. Really, it's the question of money, you know. Any patriot, patriot can become less patriot if you give enough money for him, to him or her to be less a patriot. They really believed that, and they, they totally misunderstood, of course, Ukrainians. They know so little about the history of this country. They don't know that this country was fighting for its statehood, for its independence for centuries. That time and again, they made this, this attempt to become a self-sufficient country, nation, and lost. And now, after 30 years of independence, just to give up, it up like that, with all the known corruption in Ukraine, with all its oligarchs and stuff. So that's, of course, you know, was the bad miscalculation uh, on part of the KGB guys. But the most important, returning back to our question, that once again, Putin cannot trust anyone now. Apparently. And if you ask me, and I know sooner or later you're going to ask me, is he going to use his nuclear weapons? Do you really think that, you know, if he even orders to, to, uh, to use the nuclear weapons, people, people will uh, fulfill his orders? I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure that, you know, I, you know, I honestly think that I hope that I will be able to return back to my country at the end of spring and I can return back to my country only after Putin is gone. So let's, I have many more questions about Putin and yes, the nuclear weapon one was on the list there, but let's return just for a minute before we get more into Putin and Putin's future into what you learned that we don't know from having been on the ground in Russia in these last, you know, up until the end of August, which is, you know, you mentioned the Nazi narrative, that the reason Russia had to go into, into Ukraine was to clean up the Nazis who were in Ukraine. It seemed like none of the narratives that Russia was throwing at why they were in Ukraine stuck for particularly long. There was the Nazi narrative, there was the biological weapons factories, there was the fight against this is about NATO, this is about Ukraine, this is about we're going to be welcomed as liberators, this is about protecting people in Donbass, this is about Russian speakers, right? My question for you is you talk to ordinary Russians throughout the country during this period of time. What was your take on why Russians thought that Russia was involved in this war. And was, were any of the, I mean, it looks like at the regime level, they couldn't stick with a narrative and that they didn't feel like these various narratives were succeeding. But at the mass level, at what you observe in the Russian populations, did any of these stick? Did any of these resonate? And I think in particular, my take on what happened yesterday was that there was a shift from this is a special military operation. We're just going in to help, you know, Russian speakers in Luhansk, and we were going to get rid of the Nazis, but now we're just focusing on the East, to this narrative again about why do we need mobilization? We need mobilization because this is a war against the West, and Russia's survival is at stake, and the West is trying to destroy Russia, right? Which, of course, is the irony of Russia having started this war and all those things going on. But, like, I'm particularly interested in the extent to which you think if that's the narrative that they chose to launch mobilization with, that this isn't just about Ukraine anymore, this is much bigger than Ukraine, is that a narrative that you think will resonate with the Russian people? Did you hear that during your travels of people saying this? Or do people just not understand why Russia is in this war in the first place? There are two things that did stick, at least for now. One, denazification. Uh, in the Russian psyche, and especially, you know, because of the kind of propaganda that existed for the last uh, 20 years of Putin's rule, uh, you know, as we say, we live with our head back. 
uh, so, uh, the uh, Russia, uh, Soviet victory in the World War II, in the Great Patriotic War, as we call it in, uh, in Russia, uh, was and still is, despite its 70 plus years past, the biggest achievement of the nation. And Putin uh, hijacked this memory because in each and every family of us, we have somebody who died there, or we, have, we lost 27 million people during these four years of the Great Patriotic War. You know, in each and every family, there was somebody who was killed or was wounded or returned back and etc. So it is something very personal. And uh, Putin definitely capitalized on this memory. And, you know, in the United States existed this politics of memory. memory. That's exactly what he did. He turned history into a uh, political weapon and very successful. Now, that's why when he said denazification, this is something that, you know, anywhere in, in the last, you know, the smallest village in Russia, people do understand Nazi. Nazi, these are people who, who came to the, to, to the territory of the Soviet Union and killed our people and burned down our villages with their inhabitants and, you know, and raped uh, uh, women uh, and etc. and set up concentration camps, so immediately. And second, uh, and second uh, narrative was, that's what they kept saying all the time, that it wasn't Russia which was conducting the war in Ukraine. It, Russia was preventing Ukrainian invasion into Russia. It's a pure Arvelian uh, uh, politics. War is peace, you know, truth is lying, etc. It's pure 1984. So I can tell you, you know, I was uh, um, accused of intentional spread of disinformation about the Russian army. I got four so-called, you, you call it misdemeanor charges, we call it administrative charges. And, you know, I was fined at the amount of almost $14,000. Uh, so what did I do wrong? Uh, I, I myself personally and my people on the, on the New Times .ru, we published stories about the war. We covered the war. And we wrote that uh, Kharkiv was bombed, Lugansk was bombed, uh, Odessa was bombed, that there were civilian casualties. So in the verdict, in the judge wrote that I'm guilty. Why I'm guilty? Because this information wasn't published on the website of the Minister of Defense of the Russian Federation. Why it wasn't published on the website of the Minister of Defense of the Russian Federation? Because commander in chief, Mr. Putin, commander in chief, he did say that Russia is not conducting a war. Russia is conducting a special military operation in order to prevent Ukrainian invasion. It's written, and that was hundred and thousand times, time and again repeated on all. Uh, networks, there is no, all new networks are hijacked. All, they, uh, they're controlled by the state. All of them are just propaganda TV, which is telling that Putin is, has been trying hard to prevent Ukrainian invasion. Now they say it's NATO invasion. Now, returning back to your question, is it going to stick? No, because it's one thing. When somebody else is dying, and I don't really know, you know, and, you know, the, the very first part, the, the, at least, you know, the first three, four months of the, inv of the uh, uh, Russian invasion, they were using predominantly troops from the Russian Far East and, you know, Vastochny Okrug, the Eastern uh, military uh, region. These were people... Uh, you know, there are a lot of minorities. This is what, why Russia is empire. There are a lot of minorities that were uh, conquered by uh, Russian Tsars back at the time of Catherine the Great and etc. cetera. Uh, Bodhya, Tetuva, you know, uh, 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 you know uh, they are uh, uh, Asian, you know, some of them, they came from Mongolia and etc. But anyway, these are somewhere far away and then don't look like us. 
So that's why, you know, it's very, so there were two Vinci, Buryati, and I said, once again, it's not just Buryati, there are many different tribes. But, you know, Russians call them all by uh, one uh, ethnicity. However, now, and by the way, there was just one dead from Moscow. One, because they don't draft people from Moscow, because they know that, you know, that what will, 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 you know, there will be uproar, because it will be everywhere on each and every social network. By the way, so you know, Facebook closed, banned, Instagram banned, Twitter banned. And just, you know, because, you know, some people just don't understand to which extent, uh, you know, Russians are, are closed from any information around. There is YouTube left and Telegram left. That's it. And Telegram is used heavily by the Kremlin propaganda. You know, they have, you know, thousands and thousands of different channels where they spread uh, this same propaganda. So to cut a long story short, yes, they already started talking that, you know, that's not, no longer the war with Ukraine. Now it's low, war with uh, NATO that we have a thousand long uh, front line and therefore that's why uh, they need people. Now, today, Nova Gazeta, we don't, we, there is no way we can check. You know, whatever is left from Nova Gazeta, they, uh, uh, they cited a source from the administration of the president that the draft will be as big as one million people. I doubt this, to be honest with you. I doubt that they're going to draft 300,000 because as of now, we know this, because, you know, uh, we, fall, we, you know, very closely we read channels of the Russian nationals and radicals who, you know, uh, they're in, uh, in the Ukrainian East, in Denair, so-called Denair, LNR. They don't have night vision equipment. They don't have uh, uh, secretive communications for the intelligence. They don't uh, have uh, ammunition. They don't have boots and etc. They don't have, now because they steal everything. They just you know whatever is you know it's just amazing the amount of money it looks like uh, was stolen. But anyway, so there will be no way to equip this three hundred thousand women. No way. They cannot you know even you know when you read military analysis they say. That if, for instance, Michael Kaufman, just recently CNA's uh, top specialist, he wrote that, you know, it's too late because Ukrainians started their draft. They have one million uh, manpower. Um, they started their draft in February. And by July, they more or less had enough uh, trained uh, soldiers uh, on the front. Russians, you know, the Russians, they need it now. So that's why, you know, they, of course, they will be trying to send uh, totally unprepared, unequipped people just like uh, human meat. But that's it, you know, there will be a lot of uh, corpses, but obviously, you know, there is no way they can, uh, they uh, can conduct a successful draft of that many people. Once again, I do think that reading from what I read in these 24 hours, and of course, you know, people are running, you know. Uh, some say that, you know, 100,000, you know, many thousands, thousands of people are already left. Some say as many as 1 million. We don't know, it's all, you know, because unfortunately we don't have proper information, but we can see that airports are stuffed with people. There are no uh, tickets uh, to fly to, uh, there are a few places where uh, you can fly from Moscow, no tickets whatsoever till the end of October. And, you know, there are two land crossings that left, one in, with uh, Russian, with Georgia, not Russian, Georgia, with Georgia, in the Caucasus, another one, border of Mongolia. You know, there are more than uh, five kilometers long jams people are just running out of the country. So, but to cut along, no, I don't, I don't believe in this. He is trying, he's trying to convince Zelensky that, uh, you know, he, he, that, you know, we're going to have very difficult winter. After all, you know, it's up to you, Vladimir, to decide whether you want to go into negotiation or not. I'm absolutely certain about this, but God no. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask, I want to ask mm -hmm. one more question focus now with a little bit of focus on Putin and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. You know, you have been uh, an astute observer of Putin for many years now. 
um, and, and the sort of Kremlin dynamics that are here at this point in time. And my question for you is, so you said earlier that you don't want to go back to the country while Putin is still there, but you imagine you might be able to go back in the spring. How, if Putin was to fall, and I know we can't, we can't look into it, we don't, I'm not asking whether he is going to fall or not, but if he was, what is the pathway you see to a situation where Putin is no longer president, say before 2024. How does that how does that take place in contemporary Russia in 2022 of today? How does Putin no longer continue to be to be president? And what if that does happen? What does a Russia without Putin in charge with the conflict in Ukraine ongoing look like? Of course, you know, we're, we're getting into this fantasy world. Um, but still, I think it's important to go there because we have to think about exactly what you said. What kind of country we're going to find after uh, Putin is dead? Now, there is a huge problem. It has to do with the fact that there is no mechanism. There are in, in the Soviet Union, there was more or less, uh, you know, understandable bodies. You know, there was a, an instrument how to conduct a palace coup. And it happened, you know, in 1953, uh, when uh, Khrushchev killed uh, Beria with the help of, you know, military in uh, 90, I believe, 57. Just correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, when uh, there was an attempt to overthrow Khrushchev and he succeeded. And then, of course, in 1964, the famous coup d'etat, when Lenin Brezhnev, you know, uh, uh, sent uh, Khrushchev, the general secretary of the Communist Party, the leader of the country, in oblivion and became himself the leader. And of course, it was all, all was conducted uh, by the KGB itself. And, you know, the, the head of the KGB, Simichasny, was the one who met Khrushchev at the airfield and told him that uh, he, he, he... So anyway, there was an instrument. There was the collective bodies, either it was presidium of the Central Committee of the Communist Party or it was uh, the meeting of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, which, uh, you know, at least, you know, sort of, you know, publicly made decision. It was a collective decision. They, you know, the country was told that Khrushchev uh, lost, the, for instance, lost the trust of, this, of the Communist Party and he had to go. So there was a collective body who took responsibility for that. And of course, you know, there was preparation, but it was clear how to do it, more or less legally, right? There is no such a body in Russia now, just none. No, uh, Putin is not in charge of, uh, you know, he, uh, neither Security Council can say, you know, we no longer want you. Uh, you know, there was uh, an idea uh, to create, you know, so-called Ghost Soviet, and of course, you know, Putin was smart enough not to have any collective body whatsoever. So it is a problem. Now, however, I think that uh, Russian elites or uh, Russian nomenclature does understand that there is no way for them to get at least some of their money back and to get back at least some of their life back. Uh, unless uh, Putin goes. They do, the, you know, all, whenever you get into conversations with the people of the Russian nomenclature, they talk about sanctions, they talk about billions that were frozen in the West. They lost a lot of real estate in the West and they cannot get access to it. They, uh, they, they you know, they got accustomed to live and to make money in Russia, but to, to spend this money in the big world. Uh, their uh, children were in the best boarding schools and the universities, no longer, you know. So anyway, so, but the most important that they lost billions. We are talking, you, it's important to understand that Russian government is the, it is a collective of dollar billionaires and millionaires. These are very, very rich people. And they lost any ability, you know, they were preparing the entire life that they were going, you know, when they will, you know, turn 65, they retire and they're going to enjoy life, for God's sake. And now they're going to enjoy life, you know, inside the country that they really don't like and, you know, and the life that they don't enjoy. 
So, uh, and besides, and that's the third very important thing, they're dead afraid. When you talk to them, they, they tell you about all the time, they say, do you think he's going to use Novichok again? Novichok, it's the military agent uh, with which Alexei Navalny was poisoned. Before Alexei Navalny, uh, Skripal, it was a Russian spy who turned British spy, you know, Spanish spy. You know, he was uh, also, his hand was uh, treated and it happened in Salisbury in Great Britain. So whether they are inside the country or whether they even outside it, they're afraid. But especially those who are inside the country, they're just terrified that the handle of their door, of their palaces, and they live in palaces. I was there. You know, we're going to be, you know, had a touch of Novichok, and that's it. It's a very painful death. So, uh, so it is to say that these people do understand that for them to get back at least partially their life, at least to start negotiations with Americans. And of course, you know, they see only Americans as a partners at the negotiating tables. Uh, they need, nobody is going to talk to Putin. It's like, you know, when Hitler was about, you know, to, to, uh, to get defeated, you know, nobody wanted to speak to Hitler, but a lot of people around him uh, was looking for uh, ways and means to uh, talk with Americans. So that's what I think that's what uh, sooner or later is going to, uh, to happen. And Putin does understand this. And that's why he understands that, that he cannot afford himself to lose this war. Because, wait a second, you know, he destroyed uh, life of his, he couldn't care less about us, us about, you know, ordinary Russians, of course. But he destroyed, he totally destroyed the life of his entire entourage. Listen, his closest friend, Rottenberg, had three houses in the outskirts of Atlanta, Georgia. In New York City, I can show you, I can show you at least 10, 10 houses which belong to, you know, people from Putin's entourage and they no one can use it. You know, what kind of life you suggest them to live in Russia? To live in Russia, in Moscow? With all these barbarians? You know? No, no way. And especially, don't forget, you know, in the Russian culture, when you turn 60, you're supposed to have, besides a wife, you're supposed to have, to have a mistress, 20 years, and they no longer can buy a Chanel. <laughs> <laughs> and you just imagine, for a sec, you are thinking that, you know, I'm going to spend a lovely, you know, weekend with your mistress, and then, you know, you just said, where is my Chanel? <laughs> there are luxury stores in Russia, closed all. Chanel, you know, you name it. I don't know all these names, but you know. So, uh, all closed. You know, there is, you know, in the right across from Borsche Theater, there is a great, big, big, you know, um, Neiman Marcus, I would say. It's called Soup, but, you know, it's more expensive than Neiman Marcus, you know. Uh, Kadir's wife uh, uh, get her um, supply there. So, just so to imagine, uh, you know. So, and the entire first floor is empty. Because everyone, you know, all this luxury, Burberry, Burberry, you know, Chanel, you know, all this, all of them, they're gone. These old guys, that is like that. Is this I'm about to get, I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> how are they going to approach their 20-year-old mistresses? It is a, you, you, you're laughing, guys, but that's a tragedy. After all, you know, the guys that understand that their the life expectancy for me and Russia is just 59. So, <laughs> I'm sorry, John. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's exactly where I thought we were going. <laughs> no, just it's real. Right. You asked me about a real life. No, and, you know, and, and we do, in comparative politics, a lot talk about elites and, you know, yeah. and, and authoritarian regimes and, and the, maintaining the support of elites. And so, you know, there's, a, there's also a lot of uh, a lot of importance to what Linda's saying here. All right, let me open. I, I have lots more questions, but I have lots more time. So let me open it up to the audience yeah. here. Uh, do we have questions from the audience here in New York? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Eugenia, could you move slightly to the right? I'm sorry? Could you move slightly to your right? Here? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Sure. There we go. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. um, okay. Yes. Question. Uh, so just kind of a historical question. So 
uh, there's been like a critique that, you know, in the 90s after the Soviet Union sort of disintegrated, the U.S. pushed a lot for marginalization. Bill Clinton was very like cozy with Yeltsin as they pursued reform. Do you think, looking at the Russian state today, that certain strategic mistakes were made by like, the U.S. and the West in general in approaching this new state? Listen, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, thank you. It, you know, it's a long talk. Obviously, you can find a lot of mistakes that were made by uh, uh, by the West with the, uh, with the respect to Russia. I would say that you know it was smart to uh, uh, to uh, to uh, to uh, to uh, create something like a Marshall Plan for uh, the post-Soviet Russia. Uh, however, you know, uh, if you talk to if you if you think about that, okay, the West opened uh, financial markets to Russia. The West opened technological markets to Russia. The West made Russia part of the global distribution of labor and uh, capitals, uh, especially after, you know, Putin uh, went for his second term, at least European markets, uh, capital markets opened for Russia. What did it mean? It mean that, uh, Russian businesses, Russia, uh, money in Russia always were very expensive. You know, when I had to, when I needed money for, for, for my magazine and, you know, uh, the, the interest rate was 22%. It was impossible to borrow money on the Russian market. However, if you went to the European capital market, uh, the, uh, you could get money as cheap as 3 4% plus LIBOR. It's just nothing. So... The West, in a way, did a lot for Russia by opening, uh, uh, by opening opportunities to Russian uh, businesses. And unfortunately, the outcome was the militarization of uh, Russia. Let's face it, it's true that, uh, and, you know, of course, the biggest mistake was to bring a KGB guy into power. It goes without saying that was a tragic, disastrous mistake. It was just, you know, ridiculous, you know, uh, ignorance and greed on part of the top Russian elite uh, and whoever advised them or didn't advise them uh, in the West. But basically, Russia used these, uh, the openings of the West to recreate its army and, uh, okay, and, you know, to rebuild its military industrial complex. And now what? to use these military industrial complex army to kill uh, the neighboring nation and to threaten the rest of the world with its nu nukes and etc. So I think it's not that easy. So, you know, I would suggest to look at this from the, you know, uh, in terms of institutions. That's where probably was the biggest failure, but it's a very, very uh, long talk. Uh, yes, I. Hi, Yevgenia. Thank you so much for doing the session today. Uh, my name is Natalia. I wanted to ask you, so in the beginning of today, you said that one of the major reasons, if I understand correctly, one of the major reasons why Putin started this war is really to save his own life. Um, so he, I believe that he is relying a lot on the vastness of Siberia and being able to hide and leave there in the bunker and, you know, not to make a conspiracy, but probably all things that it is true and he that need and his bunker. And my question to you is this, do you think in the worst, really in the worst case scenario, and you already mentioned, you know, the nuclear um, bomb here, can he really maintain his life there for a long time? No. <laughs> no. With the kind of, you know, listen, with the technology that existed? No. No way. Okay. okay. Uh -huh. Yes, I have a question in terms of another authoritarian regime, uh, China. Do you think it's a good lesson for them not to, you know, open up their mouths to eat out Taiwan? And do you think uh, it will stop them given the fact what uh, will give to Russia and who put the pressure in its police? Do you think uh, China will be afraid now to attack southern nation of Taiwan? Thank you. You know, I think uh, that, uh, you know, Chairman C made it clear in his recent meeting in Samarkand with Putin that he was uh, very unhappy about this uh, unfolding, uh, uh, this ongoing war in Ukraine. Uh, Chairman C also very clearly uh, told Putin 
that in case Russian army decided to invade the northern Kazakhstan, and that was, you know, what, you know, Putin's deputy in the Security Council, the former president, Dmitry Medvedev, acknowledged in one of his uh, tweets that uh, China was going to be very unhappy, that China is supporting uh, the sovereign uh, Kazakh nation. So uh, I'm not a specialist in the field. I think that uh, uh, what's really important, and that's what we saw just recently in Samarkand, that Putin is losing support from the side of China and India, and you know the uh, Prime Minister of India, uh, Modi, also expressed his dissatisfaction with this war. And uh, obviously Erdogan, who is supplying Ukraine with uh, Bayraktars, you know, these famous drones. And, you know, doing, you know, of course, you know, he's making money of this, of being the middleman, but that's okay, you know, it's okay when people make money. Uh, so, uh, so uh, that's why I think that it's important that Putin does understand that basically he has North Korea on his side, probably that's it, maybe Myanmar. But who knows, you know, sometimes it's very difficult to understand those generals. So anyway. Uh, but I mean, how big a deal is that? This change oh. from Xi that, that we go in. I mean, it's a, a lot deal. happened last week to unpack. Mm -hmm. And it's because of the counteroffensive and the speech is getting a little bit lost on the ground, but that Xi is seems to be not just withdrawing potential support, but publicly doing it in a way that other actors can observe this. Like how I mean. Prior to last week, how important would you have said that the support of China was for Russia to continue moving forward in this war? Or is it was that never part of the equation in the first place? Absolutely, it was part of the equation. Right. And that was, uh, you know, and Putin counted on China's support. Basically, the idea was that, you know, uh, to make, you know, a, a collective front with China against the United States. And uh, of, once again, we're talking about ignorant idiots, because it was very easy to see at that, you know, at the uh, trade between uh, China and the United States, China and the European Union, and China and Russia. I mean, it's just, you know, uh, it, Russia, what, you know, 20 billion, as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, half of, you know, uh, uh, the trade with uh, uh, with uh, European Union and China a uh, hundred times more. So uh, it's once again it's awful miscalculation on part of uh, of uh, Russian FSB men. And of course, you know, unfortunately, Putin is lacking expertise. It's clear. And that's the fate of any dictator, basically. We know this, but, you know, so, yes, it, it's, it's, it's a real big deal. And I think that part of the reason, by the way, why he's going for this mobilization and he's trying to force Zelensky to come to the negotiate table and sit with him and, you know, and uh, 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 get this war to the end, precisely because he realized that wait a second, when China says no, you know, they were trying to, the, the idea was that they were going to get, you know, when all the, the, the sanctions were imposed, uh, the idea was to get, you know, the counter theft. How to say it, you know, this parallel import? Rory, how would you say it in English? I, don't, I even don't know. Parallel import means that I need contraband uh, tovare. Smuggle. smuggle. True. And the idea was to smuggle uh, everything that was banned, that Russia was banned from through Kazakhstan and Turkey. And Kazakhstan totally refused. And so it's once again, it's a huge problem because, you know, it's not just about outer parts. It's not just about cars. Yes, you can buy a Maybach in Dubai. However, when it comes to medical supply, you know, uh, it was Kazakhstan. So now they left with Turkey and it's not clear how long Turkey is. No, no, it's a very big, and China refused from the very big. China just refused because they're very afraid uh, to get under the secondary sanctions. So this is what you got when you get an announcement that North Korea is selling you weapons. Everyone goes, well, that means China must not be selling. Right. But we also know that, you know, you can use the third country to sell your weapons. So we know how United States was selling weapons to Majahideen 
you know, uh, through the third country. So it's, it's obviously it's possible. I, think, I mean, I think this question of expertise, yeah. when we look back on this historically, it's going to be a big deal. Like one of the things that we were talking about a lot when the war first broke out was the extent to which Putin had been isolated during COVID, right? And how much, how many people actually had access to him during that period of time. So I think that's quite a lot. Continue, I don't know by this. Don't I, that at all. No. So he was getting lots of advice. I mean, these these images we were getting in the West of you know these meetings where he'd come in and have his you know advisors a football field away from him because he didn't want to have that. So that would be that's all true. And as of now, and that's why, by the way, I don't believe that he's going to use nukes because clearly this guy loves to live, you know, and he wants to live as long as he can. So you know, table seven nine meters long. You know, with Macron, you know. Right. Anyway, uh, but, you know, as of now, you know, whoever, you know, among from his top officials that, you know, are going to have a meeting with him, two weeks of, of the um, quarantine. quarantine, two weeks of quarantine. And, but, you know, unfortunately, I think there are a lot of, uh, a lot of gossips, but we really don't know. Uh, yes, Putin probably had less, Connect, uh, less interconnections than he had before. However, before the war, I spoke at least to, to two people who spoke with him before the war started and tried to convince him that it wasn't a good idea. One spoke seven days before the war in person, and another one spoke five or four days over the phone. And, you know, my friends know, you know, who am I talking about, right, Rory? So, so now, uh, and he, they were telling him, and, you know, there were different people whom he was inviting. It's all, you know, there were different people who was he, he was inviting. He was inviting, you know, for instance, German Greb, the head of this uh, Sberbank, you know, he spoke in person and was very much, uh, and kept telling, you know, uh, some other people whom I just don't want to name, just not to create them problems, you know, they were telling him that the, it's, it's going to be a full disaster. There were generals who were telling him that probably, you know, this idea uh, that the whole idea was based, you know, there was no blitzkrieg idea, but the idea was that after special Russian special forces uh, uh, landed in Gomel, that's the uh, military air base uh, uh, outside of Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, then Zelensky was going to run away and his people, and then this was going to be mimicked in all big cities of Ukraine, so that, you know, everybody would, elites would run because they're corrupted, they will immediately would run, there will be no leaders, yes, we will have problems with some guerrillas, but that's okay, you know, Russia army can deal with that. That was the idea. The, and so, and of course, you know, there were a hell of a lot of uh, spies and agents, for instance, city Kherson. Uh, in Kherson, that's exactly, that went uh, along with the plan. That what was planned for every, every other big city of Ukraine. Uh, that, you know, the head of the security service, SBU of Kherson, uh, told troops not to fight Russians. Allow Russians to come in, just, you know, uh, lay down your, uh, your uh, uh, weapons, don't resist. And that's how uh, uh, Russians took over Kherson. The same happened in, in Melitopol. However, in Mariupol, it didn't happen in Sumy, it didn't happen in Chernigov, it didn't happen in Kharkov, it didn't happen in Satra. But they did, but, you know, of course, you know, when we military have so on, is a model that, that uh, FSV envisioned was going to happen all across Ukraine. It didn't happen. But uh, once again, you know, he was listening, and, you know, somebody with whom, who spoke with him, you know, a week before, uh, the invasion, he said, he said that, you know, Putin, he was telling, oh, you know, I know what you're going to tell me, this, what told me this, why it's, we shouldn't do this, this told me this. So he knew all the pro and contras. And being a KGB guy, you know, he was, he's trained to try to get, you know, information from different sources. That's the nature of the intelligence to get to try to information from different sources. Um, so no, I don't buy this hypothesis about, yes. Yes, Josh. So, given all that you have learned about Putin in the years that you've been reporting on him and watching him, and given how this war has just suddenly exploded, um, apart from the fact that, yes, yeah, a KGB person, he gets information, he tries to be strategic, do you think he's an unstable person?
you know, I'm really, you know, I'm afraid to talk, to speak, or to uh, talk about character. We don't know this. I think that he has been trained very well. I remember when he was getting into power and I was writing a profile on him. I spoke with Alexei Kudrin, who was, uh, who walked along aside with, alongside with him in St. Petersburg government. And Kudrin told me that, you know, that, uh, and they published this, that's why, you know, I could openly speak about this. Uh, he said that, you know, he got a lot of training in the um, intelligence school and while he was stationed abroad, though he never was an intelligence, by the way, it's a myth. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, it may, it, it trained him, you know, um, in the ways of absorbing information, judging information, but also, you know, to keep himself intact. So I really don't know. I think, but that, I think that the biggest problem is that it's not just one man, one KGB man that came into power. That's the corporation came into power. It is specific, very specific institutional and organizational culture. Trust me, should you have, you know, uh, you know, just uh, instead of uh, you have now you have 17 organizations in your intelligence community. Just imagine for a fact for, 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 for a minute that you have one and this one controls everything. And Hoover back, you know, uh, got out of his grave and he's the president of this country. You would have a lot of problems. You know, we read a couple of, you know, we can imagine this after reading, you know, plot against America. So, um, uh, so I would say that uh, it's not about his character. It's about this organ institutional organizational culture that believes in violence, that uh, doesn't believe in, in uh, any self-governance, democratic governance, but the most importantly, that it's preoccupied with all kinds of conspiracy theories and believes in violence. That I would say the two major characteristics of this uh, institution. That's what creates a lot of uh, problems. I understand that, George, you are probably uh, asking this because of the, he has control over nukes. In the Russian system, I don't know the way it is in this country, but in the Russian system, there are at least five people who have to agree with the decision to push the button. At least five on different levels. And, uh, and so, and when you, and of course, you know, I was asking this question and the answer is, usually the answer is, I'm not so sure that those who in between are going to go for that. So I'm not so sure either. Besides, I don't believe that these billionaires, they're ready to end their life and life of their children in the nuclear dust. No, I don't buy this. Okay, we're getting close to the end. So what I want to do is collect a few questions and then you can respond to sort of all of them together just so we make sure people get a chance to ask. So Rory, but don't answer it because we need a couple more. Okay. So you, you talk quite a lot about Russian miscalculations and Putin miscalculations going into this war. But there's another set of miscalculations on our side that's go all the way back to 2014. And starting with the idea that if you do alienate, if, if Putin alienates this ultra rich elite around him through Western sanctions, that they will turn against him. And that hasn't happened. Um, and the other calculation was that if the Russian economy is severely degraded and, and living standards fall year after year after year, that that will also erode. Putin's support and cause him to question his uh, foreign policy decision making. And that hasn't happened either. And even after the beginning of the war, where the, the, the sanctions became much more severe, again, no apparent um, reaction from the elite. The, all these oligarchs are declaring themselves completely impotent and unable to affect any decision making in Russia, unable to, to do anything about what's going on. And the population, which has again uh, endured another major step down in its living standards, hasn't seemed to uh, to react. And you know, you obviously can't really believe the polling, but there's no real evidence, apart from uh, a few thousand people who've been arrested, that there's 
there's serious uh, resistance to what he's doing. The question is, is this mobilization the straw that breaks this back, that actually changes things, that actually um, brings up to your average Russian, as you were suggesting in the beginning? Is this going to be a change, or is Putin's calculation on his own ability to endure actually correct, that he can go the distance, even in the face of um, more suffering by, by average Russians and by the, the elite? Let me, you know, quickly ask, because, you know, we, we don't want to lose the uh, Rory, you know, I, I, I can tell you yes and no. First of all, you know, there is no consolidation of elite. Just none. It's all bullshit. Can I use this word? Okay, so, uh, <laughs> I did, right? So, there is no consolidation of elite. There is fear. There is, you know, they are desperate to get out of this situation. They don't understand how, you know, they're calling, you know, people like me and saying, Jenny, can you really, you know, make a tape and saying that I'm a great guy? And they say, listen, you know, I know each and every one who helped Russian opposition. You're not among them. Sorry, I can't. I know each and every one. But, you know, no, there is no consolidation of the lead. And I think that sooner or later, these will, uh, these, uh, will, will produce a result. Secondary, talking about uh, these sanctions 2014, they were not enough. They were halfway, Rory, you know, this better than anybody else. That, you know, yes, you know, you impose sanctions, but then, you know, you allowed Russian banks to find the sideways. You know this, and we know this. And, you know, and they were terrified at the beginning. Oh, God, you know, what we're going to do with our software? And then it turned out that, yes, you know, Americans are going to look other way around. And of course, you know, the, the, what you did in 2008, that's inexcusable. When they were imposed after the war in Georgia, they were imposed sanctions. And, you know, there was this chit chat, you know, from the side of the Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, we're going to do three months after. What? Nothing. Just everybody forget about sanctions. And Putin got the message that you guys are weak. That, you know, you are no better than Russians, that you are so, you know, you also, you know, you want my, you know, all people are corrupted by, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. That was the mistake. You, when you deal with the, institu with the institutional culture of the KGB, you don't show them that you're weak. You show them that you are capable to sustain the pressure. You are capable to stand still and straight. And of course, you know, when you show that you, you are unable to держа to, to, to you know, wow. Of course they use it again. So but so, but in any case, you know, I think it's and as for the sanctions, you know, uh, um, on the Russian economy, uh, we are going to have Sergei Guriev on uh, September 29th, you know. I, um, I think that he's much better than that. You know, he thinks that, you know, it just takes time. All right, so, I mean, we said we we're going to 5.30. Listen, I'm okay, you know. You're okay. We're talking about I Russia. I love nothing more than to talk about right. Russia. So anyone who needs to leave because of all sorts of reasons yes. does not feel bad about yeah. leaving, but we'll continue. We'll, so we'll give just a second because everyone's so there. So here. But if you want to say, we can take some more questions for a few more minutes. Yes, yeah. 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 Six twenty. All right. Okay. We won't. We will not go past five forty-five. We'll keep going a little bit here. We have a couple people who have some questions here. So okay. you were next. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, my question was about kind of like this ruling elite and like these billionaires that are all. Putin's friends, and when you mentioned that it wasn't just one man coming to power, it was like a whole sort of institution that had shifted in and moved in. And now you're talking about how um, these incredibly rich people with their sanctions don't necessarily want this war to continue because they want to try and get like their life back. But what I was wondering was, is it possible that some of them may be incentivized for 
not necessarily the war to continue, but for someone like Putin to still come into power afterwards out of fear of possible like retribution for their participation in this system, like from whether it's a new regime that is ushered in or just the people of Russia that are basically pissed off that they let this happen in the first place. I'm just kind of wondering if there's possibly an incentive for them to want him. To yes, the answer is yes. And most likely that's exactly what's going to happen. The people who are going to conduct this, whatever, you know, they're going to conduct, there will be people from Putin's closest entourage. And people who are going to take over will be people from the same KGB guys. So it will be junta for a while, for sure. And that's what happened in many Latin American countries when coup d'etat happened in 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and sometimes even the 80s, if we speak about Bolivia. So, uh, so yes. But just to pick up on that for a second, right? So the idea here is you'll get more of the same, but the tr transition away from Putin will be kept, will will also come along with some sort of deal to get out of Ukraine and get the sanctions reduced. Is that the the three moving pieces? Yes. There? Okay. Because in order to get their money back, they need to make a, a peace with Ukraine. In order to, because there is no peace, there is no money back unless they make a peace with Ukraine. But yes, it will be junta for a while, but it will be illegitimate. And in any case, you know, yes, it will be much. It, it, it anyway. It is a work in progress, you know. After you know, after it happens, uh, so it's not going to be nice. Probably it will be messy. Probably it will be bloody. Probably the country will be falling apart. Most likely, you know, uh, you know, we will see disintegration, the further disintegration of the empire. Most likely, you know, it, it, the kind of Russia that we're going to foresee uh, in, uh, you know, five years from now, uh, and of course, 10 years from now, it will be much smaller. And, you know, it's not going to be easy because the West will think twice before, you know, helping Russia with capital markets or with technologies or et cetera. It's not going to be easy. It's true. Jane, did you have a question? Um, well, I, uh, yeah. yeah Jane broke um, I was going to ask uh, back to the beginning of the war, why do you think that the KGB or FSB people um, seem to have had such poor information or give provide such poor information? My my experience in in Soviet Union and Russia is the last years of Perestroika when everybody knew the KGB people knew a lot about what was going on. So why did they not have as, as much information as they should have had in? Ukraine, they were socking through all the institutions of the former republics. Um, or is there another explanation for why um, the information about what would happen with the war was so poor? Uh, my understanding is that, that uh, FSB people, it's service number five. Uh, was dealing with their counterparts, the, with their colleagues from the uh, Soviet KGB, which was, you know, then turned into Ukrainian KGB. And, you know, both sides, are, they're of course corrupted. A lot of money were involved, hell of a lot of money were involved in that. And uh, they were promised that, you know, after that all, you know, that uh, they had to deal with Zelensky and his, you know, close on to rush, everything else will follow. It's going to be domino effect. So don't worry, we have our people everywhere in each and every, of course, there is bull, it's called death bull in Ukraine. Um, so, of course, you know, they, first of all, it's, it's a well-known effect of asymmetry of information, for one. Secondary, when it's a question of money, you know, you know that, you know, if you uh, give information that you want to hear, you're going to get a great buck. So I think it's also, you know, it's, it's a problem of corruption. And secondary, uh, Ukraine is not Russia. It's true uh, what Kuchma wrote in his book, because it's much more uh, networking society. 
Russia is much more vertical structure, whereas Ukraine is much more horizontal structure. Even its army, the VSU, you know, they are the the that commanders. They are making decisions, you know, on their own. They don't have to consult Kiev whether they can, and you know, with the so Russian army, it's vice vice versa. So it's 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 it, the structure of the country is very is it's it's a not working country, you know, and so I think these also they miscalculated because even if somebody in Mariupol or you know in uh, you know in Papasna decided uh, that they were going to give uh, uh, the city to Russians, you know, people just disagreed with that. They said no. We're not going to, to go with you. So I think these three factors, first and foremost, but of course, you know, we are lacking, we have very little information about that. And I think that, of course, Zelensky, that's what, uh, uh, that's what uh, Kotkin said in his interview to David Remnick. I think it was very true to the fact that when he said that Zelensky, Vladimir Zelensky probably wasn't the greatest president. He didn't know how to, to govern, but he turned out to be a great communicator. And this ability of his to communicate, to talk to people, each and every evening, each of us was listening to Zelensky's statement that he was making each and every evening. You know, it is something, you know, it was amazing that, you know, how he was capable to get his message through and to get, you know, to unite the nation. You know, his rating was falling before the war. He has over 90%, of course, it's a war and et cetera, but still people are getting through a lot of, you know, difficulties and still, you know, they support him. I mean, I think another thing about information that will be something we will look at in the future to look back on this year is it goes back to corruption. And you don't think of corruption as having a direct impact on information. But you bring the generals in and you say, I just gave you $30 billion to improve your military. How's the military? You don't say it's not a good military, right? Like, so I think that's another question too about how much of this money that was supposed to be for modernization gets stolen, where it gets stolen, and how that affected the quality of information that was coming up the, the command at that point in time too. But anyway, you had your hand up for quite a while. I want to make sure you uh, answer yeah. that question. Well, should I talk a little about Russia's like more than Russia's percep perception of Soviet Union? Because you know, like a lot of people don't come into power after the collapse of the Soviet Union, right? And naturally, he's very critical of Soviet like communism ideology. But a lot of time, he also praised Soviet leadership. Although he still claims that the collapse of the Soviet Union is the greatest geopolitical disaster in the 20th century, and then Putin made numerous reference to revive a Soviet territorial claim. After all, I think he made a reference with him to uh, Peter the Great's uh, the spring where he re referred, uh, he made like a comparison with the invasion of Ukraine with Peter the Great's uh, war with Sweden. So uh, I'm a little bit curious about how will no more Russian people perceive uh, Soviet Union after all, how did the Soviet Union uh, influence still exists in Russian society today? You know, there is a clear cut generational divide. For instance, your Baron, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, talks with people across the Russian provinces suggested that uh, those uh, in the retirement age or post at the retirement age, uh, they were in support of the war precisely because, you know, they kept, oh, you know, Putin is getting us back to the times of the glory of the Soviet Union. Putin who grew up, uh, who put people who grew up during the Soviet times, you know, and remember, you know, the, the power of the KGB and the power of the state, they're also much more prone to say that they were in support of the war. Whereas uh, those in their thirties and forties, I didn't mean a one person in this age. In, you know, and I, I made, you know, three, 4,000 kilometers across Russia, uh, who were in, probably there are, but I didn't meet, uh, who were in support of the war. For them, uh, Soviet Union is non-existent entity. They know nothing about it. When you say about, you know, the general status of the Communist Party, they don't know what I'm talking about. When I was teaching, they didn't know what, you know, when I said, you know, do you know what is called Central Committee of the Communist Party? General Central of the Communist Party, no, they know nothing about that. So it's non-existent uh, a story for for great many of them. For among the twenties, you know, what was very interesting for me that you know among these twenty-year-olds, 
in small cities, they felt like, you know, Putin is cool. You know, he's, he's a cool guy. You know, he's not afraid to show those Ukrainians that, that you know, they should respect Russians. And, you know, of course, you know, this Putin's uh, nationalism, yes, it definitely uh, got that message across. And, you know, and this idea that Russians are superior to other uh, nations and minorities, of course, you know, it's, it, it's, uh, it is something that, but, you know, what's really important to understand, the biggest difference, there is no ideology. There is no, in the Soviet Union, for good or for bad, there was ideology. There was this idea of, you know, of communism, whatever uh, people thought about it. But, you know, and that's what attracted the half of the world to the Soviet Union. There is no ideology now, just none. They are talking, there are, you know, uh, 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 there are certain agreements, but there are no ideology. They are all opportunists. Today they are communists, tomorrow they are not communists. Today they are in favor of the uh, small and middle-sized business. Tomorrow they say that, you know, we need more state corporate. They are opportunists. And therefore it's very difficult, you know, to unite people around because they, they don't have, you know, there is a party which is called Communist Party of the Russian Federation. They are neither communists, they are just, you know, orthodox Stalinists. You know, but they say that they're communists. So anyway, but it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's uh, people, you know, the idea of the Soviet Union uh, will die out with the dying of the generation which remembers, you know, the Soviet Union. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gonna, yeah, yeah. We yeah. have a lot of questions on Zoom that we have to answer. Yes, today, yes, so yes we we'll have. Take a couple of uh -huh. so I'm going to go one in the weeds and then one general one to end it. Um, the in the weeds question is, uh, in the event of a junta or a coup, what would happen to Petrushev? What role would he play, given that he's a true believer in the war? Petrushev is one of those rare ideologues. Yeah. I don't know. Because, you know, it's a very, it's very interesting question. Petrushev is an ideologue for sure. But when you ask about his son, who is Minister of Agriculture, and people say he's very pragmatic. When people in Russia say he's very pragmatic or he's very realistic, it means he loves it, you know, money. You can make a deal with him. You can buy him out. So that's why, you know, it's also a little bit generational problem. I don't know, but, you know, Patrushev is very loyal and very close to Putin. That's true. Right. He's the head of the, the not the head, but, you know, he's secretary of the, uh, of the um, Security Council of the Russian Federation. All right, so I'm going to close with a question from uh, Zoom, which, you know, you started this on a very personal note, and then we've gotten into a ton of policy and a ton of, mm -hmm. you know, public opinion and, and, and possible scenarios for transition and all these sorts of uh, more, more um, less personal questions and more just taking advantage of your expertise, but I'm going to end with a personal question that came in on the on the Zoom, uh, from the Zoom chat, which, which I'm going to just read it, which is, thank you, it's just from an anonymous attendee, thank you so much for your talk. Please, what would you say to the thousands of young guys in Russia now desperate about the possibility of being sent to the front? I would like say don't, don't take the scene on yourself. Don't go to war. Escape if you can. Don't kill. That's the most, it's, from my perspective, it's better to go to jail, but to have blood on your hands. You will never excuse yourself. For it. Don't put this on your children. Just try to escape. There are still ways and means to escape. All of us, we know this. Get in your car. If you cannot cross the border now, uh, you know, Russia is a vast country. You don't need to go to Siberia in order to escape. Go to Arkhangelsk Oblast. Go to Murmansk Oblast. Go to Minetsk Krai. You know, and you can hide there for a while. Then, you know, there will be the traffic jams, you know, at the borders uh, will, be, will be eased up and you will be able to leave the country. Or you will be able, you know, there are ways and means. Fly to Omsk. Take a train to the northern uh, Kazakhstan. 
You don't need foreign passport in order to get to northern Kazakhstan. You can use, you can be with your Russian passport. You cannot open a credit card or a bank account, but that's okay. You know, if you need money, I will send you money. But, you know, uh, there are ways. Look at the map and look at our borders. Once again, you can get on the train. Uh, so Omsk is not far. You can, if you cannot get on, if you don't want to get through the airport security, hire a cab, a, a cab driver. I drove to the border 14 hours, you know, uh, you know, with, uh, with somebody. So uh, drive uh, to Omsk, it will take you less than 24 hours and take a train from there. Uh, you can go all the way to Irkutsk. You can go to Ekaterinburg. Just look at the map. We have hell of a lot of borders. Mongolia is opened. You know, China is not far from Amurusk Obis, after all. You know, you can go there. So, but anyway, uh, it, it's probably difficult to cross, uh, now to cross uh, border to Baltics on land. It's difficult. I did this, but you know, I, I don't think it's visible now. But you, it's your choice. If you want, if you don't, do not kill, that's what you have to tell yourself and do everything in order to avoid it's this awful choice. Just escape, especially if you're young. Okay, on that note, please join me in thanking sharing of her, of her personal story here. I want to draw everyone's attention, both on Zoom and here. Again, we have started, uh, since Jen, you got here, we've put in a series which will be going on for the whole year, which is in conversation with Eugenia Albas. We have a great lineup coming up. Sorry, Sergey Goryev is coming. We have uh, Peter Baker and Susan Glasser from the New York Times and New Yorker. We have David Remnick from the New Yorker. We have a lot of people who are going to be coming over the course of the year. Some of these talks will just be virtual if we don't have people here in New York. Some of them will have audiences here in New York. So keep an eye out for the Jordan Center. And we're you know, delighted to have her here this year. And we're looking forward to, to all the expertise and wisdom she can share with us. So thank you all. For that. Thank you.